Uh, so, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Policy Exchange. I'm Richard Howard, um, Head of Energy and Environment at Policy Exchange. Um, thank you for coming along to today's event, which is the Energy Efficiency Dragon's Den. Um, this will follow a similar format to the Dragon's Den, just without the big piles of cash on the table or the funky decor and leather chairs and urban <laughs> chic warehouse. But um, what we'll be doing, basically, is inviting a number of energy experts to pitch their policy ideas to our panel of dragons. Um, the focus of the event is on energy efficiency, specifically on domestic energy efficiency, um, which is a hugely topical subject at the moment, um, not least because in the summer um, the government's main flagship policy around this, the Green Deal, has been cancelled, so there's um, quite a lot of space to, to do some new thinking about policy. Um, there's also been a, an awful lot of new reports and, and research coming out in recent weeks about energy efficiency. And there was a report earlier this week by New Climate Economy, uh, which is labelling energy efficiency as the first fuel, I think quite aptly, um, and suggesting that energy efficiency could make a very large dent in, in terms of um, G20 company, uh, countries meeting their decarbonisation targets. Um, we've also shown through our own analysis, our report, um, the customer is always right. There's some copies at the back if you want to pick one up. Um, we showed that energy efficiency is arguably the cheapest way to, to meet decarbonisation goals in the UK. Um, and other analysis by people like Frontier Economics shows that an ambitious energy efficiency programme could um, result in some very material savings for households in terms of energy bills and also reduce fuel poverty and so on. So it's a very strong case for doing lots on energy efficiency um, at the domestic level. Also, some interesting analysis by ECIU um, earlier this um, only came out yesterday, which shows that energy efficiency is the most popular choice as well in terms of um, ways of meeting decarbonisation goals, more popular than renewables, more popular than fossil fuels. Um, it is by far the most popular policy choice in the energy space. But as I say, there's a, there is a gap in terms of, there's uncertainty hanging over where energy efficiency policy is going. Um, and there's a, there's a need to, to kind of crack on with energy efficiency. So research recently by Energy Bill Revolution showed that um, the UK homes are still amongst the worst in terms of energy efficiency across Europe, um, and we have some of the highest levels of fuel poverty as well. Um, so really, the purpose of today's discussion, given the closure of the Green Deal, is to really think about what are the new policies that we could put forward in this space. Um, and that's, we'll be thinking about policies across the spectrum of different ways that you can tackle the problem, whether that's about financial incentives, financial enablers, or regulation. We'll be hearing some very different approaches to how you can incentivize energy efficiency behavior. Um, we're particularly interested in policies, given the CSR and, and where we are in terms of budgets and so on, um, particularly interested in policies that, that don't cost government a lot of money. Um, so thinking about new and, and innovative ways of, of tackling the problem. Um, Beyond this event, this event is kind of the, the starting point. Beyond the event itself, Policy Exchange will do a, a short report writing up um, the proceedings and, and giving our own analysis of the different ideas and, and making some recommendations. So I'd like to um, quickly introduce the Dragons um, for today's session. So starting on your left, um, we have um, Dr. Dan Poulter, who's the MP for Central Suffolk and North Ipswich um, since 2010. Um, he's... Um, become a, a member of the Energy and Climate Change Select Committee um, since the summer and previously held a role as the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State in the Department of Health. He's also a qualified medical doctor and I should say he has to leave slightly early because he is going to go and do doctor things at his surgery from 10.30 so he does need to get away but um, we thank him for making the time today. Um, in the middle, Richard Black, Director of the Energy and Climate in, uh, Intelligence Unit which is an NGO um, which focuses on um, informing the debate on energy and climate change issues, essentially. He was previously with the BBC as science and environment co correspondent. Um, and finally, um, Dr Alan Whitehead, um, MP for Southampton Test since 1997, who has, has a, it's fair to say, a very long history um, and great experience in the energy and environment fields. Um, he's now the shadow, shadow Minister for Energy and Climate Change very recently and was previously um, on the Energy and Climate Change Select Committee as well since 2009 and is Chair of Preseg. So he's very, very actively involved in this space and, and knows the ground extremely well. So very thankful to have all the speakers here. Um, also thankful to the sponsors for the event, um, who are the European Climate, Change um, European Climate Foundation, now for insulation, MIMA, which is the Mineral Wool Insulation Manufacturers Association, and Wilmot Dixon, who've all very kindly supported the event. 
Um, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Dan Poulter, who's going to give a short introduction to the session. Dan, would you like to come up? Thank you, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Apologies for my slightly dressed down appearance, but you now understand why, because I'm on to going to do clinical work um, pretty much straight away after I leave here. But it's a pleasure to join you today. I think uh, we've got a a uh, good opportunity to talk about some important issues which affect uh, the energy and climate change agenda. With Paris and the comprehensive spending review come up, there is a window of opportunity um, to influence uh, thinking after those events. Uh, and in particular, uh, I think what will be important is looking at um, the opportunities to deal with energy efficiency in a way that takes, takes something forward that can generate investor confidence in, in the market. Some of that, of course, mm -hmm. comes down to government as well, but also uh, one that can, we can take forward with scale and pace for the energy consumer as well. So I think I'm sure there'll be a number of interesting ideas around technology and how we can better utilise and harness technology in the energy efficiency area. Um, and uh, as we all know, there can be a win-win situation here on issues such as the cost of living um, and helping uh, to reduce uh, fuel poverty, which is something that interests me in the other work that I do or the work that I'm going to do uh, when I leave here, as well as in reducing uh, carbon emissions. So um, what will be good to hear today uh, and look forward to hearing the contributions will be where will there can be some quick wins. And I'm sure on the demand side there are some very quick wins that we can deliver but also how we can uh, hopefully generate uh, investor confidence uh, and also uh, have a range of options which will both uh, improve the cost of living uh, and reduce carbon emissions. So I look forward to the contributions today uh, and thank you to Policy Exchange for inviting me to join you. Um, so we'll now invite David Adams um, to deliver his pitch. David's the technical director at Wilmot Dixon, which is uh, an energy services company and, and construction firm involved in low energy retrofits of homes, and he's going to be pitching an idea around linking the stamp duty regime to energy performance. David. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dragons. Um, <clears throat> from the previous two speakers, it makes you wonder why we're even here. I mean, it's so obvious, and it's such a good idea. Why do we even need to be here? And the issue is, as we're all aware, that whilst it's extremely important, for society, and it, indeed it's really good for the householder, there's a market failure. And what my pitch is about is seeking to address that market failure. Because the current approach, we compensate for the market failure. And we do it with quite a lot of money. Um, and it doesn't seek to resolve it, indeed one might argue a bit, it actually makes the market failure worse. So my pitch is a mechanism to bias the house selling market, tip it towards lower energy homes, influence the market price. An analogy would be, you've seen it, trees on the, on the coast, right by the sea, yeah, uh, tend not to grow straight up, they lean over um, with the prevailing wind. Um, they're not pushed over, they grow leaning over because the invisible hand of the wind is encouraging them to do so. So I'm talking about how do we use the invisible hand of the market to help us rather than fight against us. So what's the proposal? To take the standard, the new uh, uh, standard uh, stamp duty land tax calculation and then adjust it for the energy performance of the home. And the great thing is about this is it's really easy to implement. To give you a quick rundown. When a whole home is sold, you know an EPC is undertaken today. The conveyancing solicitor already registered the property with HMRC, as today, and, a, and the stamp duty is calculated. At that point, the model goes off, pulls the EPC, which can be done today, as you know, uh, its landmark database, and adjusts it, just nudges it up or down based on that energy performance around a neutral axis say, a sap of 63. And that's just popped out of the air. Yeah? Um, for each point below, then you nudge the amount of stamp duty up. And this is done very proportionately, because obviously some people paying 
with low-value homes will, will be responsive to actually quite a small adjustment. That will get their minds. And some people, I was amazed, I don't know if anyone lives in homes that cost more than £2 million. Pounds. I, the nice thing is they do pay an enormous amount of stamp duty. Yeah? So, uh, of course, they're going to be more sensitive to rather larger adjustments. Yeah? But, of course, um, in percentage terms, uh, that can then uh, make quite an interesting effect. Um, neutral point and these factors need to be reviewed such that this is revenue neutral and maintain, continues to be revenue neutral over time. Fairly straightforward to, forward to do. Um, and importantly, there's a rebate mechanism here such that if you have had to pay more stamp duty, as long as you act within 12 months and relodge your uh, EPC, then you can go on the website, add your unique number, um, and claim your rebate, personally signed by George Osborne. Would be nice. Marketing, free. Um, key here is this isn't being penal. We're not talking about blowing the tree over. We're talking about encouraging it, the market to go in a particular direction. What are the characteristics? It's idea is to prompt the household to, to reflect on energy performance at the point they're making a decision to purchase a house. And of course, if it's a pretty energy efficient house, they'll feel good about that decision. A bit like getting the survey back and going, oh my goodness, I didn't realise the chimney was falling down, yeah, and that's going to cost me some money, there might be the reaction of, hang on a minute, I hadn't appreciated how much this home's going to cost to run. Nudged because the solicitor's spoken to them and told them, actually, your stamp duty is higher because this isn't a very well performing home. Or it could, of course, have the reaction of a complete rethink. I suggest it's going to be more, and what we want to achieve is a push on that market price. It's revenue positive. It's revenue positive because it's neutrally balanced, but of course, any works that are undertaken create a tax revenue stream to the government. So it's positive. It's long term because it's not costing the government anything to do so there's a belief it will stay and also what's even better, those that are used to fit and what have you and uh, eco it phases itself out. As these factors increase, as the stock improves, it phases it out. So my pitch is for a modest long term market advantage being given to more efficient homes and moving in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to stay on the stage. So um, we'll just kick off with some questions. We're, the panel, the dragons will, will question. There will also be hopefully time for audience Q&A as well. So, I mean, I, I love this idea. I think it's a great idea, particularly the fact that it can be revenue neutral. It's kind of working with the process that people already yep. use. Um, do we know anything about how it, what's the distributional effect of this policy? How would it impact on different sets of people? Is there any correlation between um, incomes, and house prices and energy efficiency. How does that all work? Have you thought that through? So the nice thing here is we've got lots of levers that can be applied to ensure that the distributional effects are minimised. Um, so if someone is paying a relatively modest amount for a home, then we're in a position to ensure that that nudge is, or that adjustment is sufficient to appeal to them but not overburden them. Um, Typically, looking at the numbers that I'm working with, we're important to emphasise this is about a long-term push. If you're looking for a response next year, which would be much more prone to the effects you're talking about, then uh, an immediate large-scale response would be uh, potentially impacted with distribution effects. This is about getting into people's head a long-term trajectory. Therefore, we're far less exposed to distribution effects. When I've looked at it, I don't see them particularly, but one to really analyse in more detail. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Um, I mean, firstly, there is a question of the extent to which that actually really does nudge most of the market, the obvious point being that it's based on uh, the point at which a house is sold and there's a combination of the fact that in, in, in many instances the, the churn in, in, in housing... Um, is not that frequent in certain uh, areas and certain age profiles. And uh, secondly, obviously, it, 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 it doesn't uh, affect uh, the rented market uh, and so on. Uh, 
do you think that the, uh, this instrument itself um, would have the sort of significant impact on constant thinking? That is, the, uh, the, the thinking that would have to go on on a regular basis uh, about the energy efficiency of properties rather than the point at which property is being sold. And I, I, I personally do like the, the, the policy a lot in general, but my concern uh, would be that uh, it, it might nudge people at particular points and cause people to park the issue on other occasions. I, I think that... It so, series of points there. The idea behind this is it, um, even at the, at the point of uh, purchase or seeking to move, when people are seeking to move, they do all kinds of crazy things. They paint the front door, they're told to get rid of bright colours, they do all kinds of stuff. They are sensitive to what makes a home attractive. Important, yeah? Um, obviously, when people move in, they tend to spend quite a lot of money improving their home, and that's exactly the point that they can uh, uh, see a, a benefit. The times in between, well, um, we have a large housing stock, uh, 26 million or so, and on average we move every 12 years. So this is applying to, say, 2 million homes, 1.5 million homes um, <coughs> a year. Yeah. So we're talking quite large numbers anyway, but what's great about the British is, home-owning British is, they are quite like to know the value of their house. Yeah? And they're quite sensitive to a narrative where the plumber turns up and um, when describing the work they could do whilst they're there, could be saying you do realise at the time you would perhaps come to sell, are you thinking of this also has an impact in terms of X, Y, Z. So I would suggest it gives quite a lot of tradespeople a narrative to run with, which isn't... Um, uh, is how compelling is that? The point here is that we've got enough homes to work on, and actually, we want it to be pretty soft to begin with. We need to get the policy in. We need to get under people's skin. We're trying to move a super tanker here, and it isn't intended, and it won't pivot on, uh, on an axis. This is something that builds up over time. Have you done any estimates of the actual um, energy and carbon savings that could be got for them from this nationwide? I mean, if you, if you know how often people move on average, you just give us that figure, and you can estimate the sort of amount of behaviour change that you might get per move. You should be able to do those calculations, I would have thought. I, I, I think it's, it's hard, because we are dealing much more with the irrational side of um, uh, purchasing behaviour rather than the rational. Um, and, uh, of course, the Treasury, when they did um, move the, um, the tax, on the licensing tax, they got that rather wrong because it was far more successful than they thought it would be and it cost them a lot of money. So if the Treasury are unable to predict, predict it, um, I would be, frankly, disingenuous because I would be guessing, coming up with numbers that really don't have a, a strong enough grounding. What I would say is tax does influence behaviours and... We actually want it to start slowly, and if we find there's a particular element that we like or don't like, or it is or isn't, then each year at the budget, you would tweak those levers and steer this policy. Um, the point is we're going with the market, and markets, as you know, can be terrifically powerful. You've opened up that opportunity, which we don't have today. Just another question. Is there any real-world evidence for this? I mean, we have 190-something countries world. Has, has, have any of them tried anything like this with any degree of success or failure? On homes, no. But we've got plenty of policy about how tax changes behaviours, be it with cars, be it with landfill tax, with it, all kinds of different taxes we know change behaviours. So I would argue we should be looking at evidence of why it shouldn't work. I mean, there's so much compelling evidence to say it would. Bearing in mind, it's very cheap to do. Well, I, I question how, how transferable that is, because as you said, we're often dealing with the realms of the irrational here rather than the rational. So it seems to me a bit of real-world evidence on this, on terms of how, what choices people make in that sort of situation would be quite valuable. If it's there, maybe it's not there. It, it, we can't find it for the sales of particular properties, and it's tr quite tricky to trial. Um, we've been thinking around that. Could you do Greater Manchester? Yeah, but remembering this is intentionally 
something to shift behavior over time, you're talking quite a long trial. I think the parallels work well, and uh, it is revenue positive, and we're very short of things that are. So, kind of, it's a, a leadership step belief that tax will move behaviors, and I think there's good evidence for that. I mean, instinctively, I, I like the philosophy behind this. The only question I would have, picking up what Alan alluded to earlier, is you are dealing with a particular part of the market, um, but you're also dealing with uh, the potential. You also, I do wonder how much you've thought, you've all thought through how much this may incentivise within the house purchasing market, which end of the market it would it would incentivise because um, people, when they move home, often are quite financially stretched. Yes. Um, <coughs> and particularly people on lower incomes can be quite financially stretched if they become fir first-time homeowners. And whether they would have the money to invest in the home efficiency measures that you describe uh, in the first year or two is something that may be a matter mm. of mm. debate. And I wondered, you know, have you got any evidence that would support uh, or any anything that would support that that, that particular area, the sort of the, the lower value homeowners yeah. um, who, are, who are, would, would be supported by this policy? Two things. First is, of course, below threshold, people don't even pay stamp duty. Yeah? In this model, they would, if they're above the... Um, 125, yeah. One, yes, one, below 125. One, 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 they, below that level, um, so quite a lot in the north, um, the, uh, the, if they're above the... Uh, neutral access, then they would get a home energy efficiency bonus. So it is only positive. Yeah, For those that are stretching that above the 125, A, the nudge is, is modest because actually they are in that circumstance. They will be much more sensitive to these numbers. Yeah, And actually, isn't it even more important they understand the running costs of their homes? So what you're trying to do there actually is less... Um, the, the money element is to get them to really think. So uh, I would argue as long as you do not overburden it, and believe you me, this is not about overburdening them, especially at that level, you're actually causing to think, really think, about something that actually has far more significance in subsequent years than in year one. We've got time for one quick question from the audience. Gentlemen here. Nigel Vybot Bithson, CEO of Freedom, um, a renewables company in the domestic uh, energy efficiency sector. Love your idea. Our market research shows that 53% of people will not use any incentive along the lines of Green Deal and so on in the year prior to selling their home. The other problem that we've got is because of the banking crash, um, people are so stretched because of the... Um, fierce new environment in terms of lending multiples, in terms of the amount of deposit one has to put down on the house, that there is no money available to do large-scale home improvements in the year, two years after you've moved in. So here's my idea, which is, why don't, and, and I believe that the net impact on government borrowing would be zero, would be for the government to offer um, a one-year interest-free no payments loan to people who are self-certifying, simply ticking a box on an online statement that says, we are intending to sell our home the next year. All of that money will be recoverable, the tiny, tiny proportion not. And here's the key. People who are going to be faced with a hit on stamp duty, let's lean that tree over slightly more by offering them the money, removing the excuse not to make those home improvements, which of course will add value to the property and will be recoverable as a cost out of the sale of the property. If I could draw on very briefly, this is, uh, I think this illustrates the point. This works well with other ideas. It's not the only thing one would need to do. There are equity release type charges that could go on or all other kinds of things from a funding perspective that would help. Our papers on them if you want to read them. But this is complementary and actually reinforces the next three speakers. But remembering it's complementary and revenue po positive. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there and move on to the next speaker because we're going to have to keep the time. But thank you very much. 
I now invite Dustin Benton, who is the Head of Energy and Resources at Green Alliance, where he leads on low carbon energy and resource stewardship, and he's going to pitch an idea around an energy efficiency feed-in tariff. Thank you very much. Uh, so I've got what sounds like a counterintuitive proposal, and that's that we should pay people to save energy, even though it already makes economic sense for them to do so. <clears throat> Uh, we should do this in two ways, via feed-in tariff for megawatts, uh, units of energy avoided rather than generated, uh, and that should compete with electricity generation, and we should give out equal access to the capacity market uh, for demand reduction response. So the immediate question, which I guess is in all of your minds, is why? This sounds crazy, right? People are already incentivized. <clears throat> well, I've got three answers. The first is, it works. Uh, the state of Texas, which is not known for its socialist spread the money around tendencies, has been paying for energy savings since 2006. Uh, and in 2010, uh, the state auditors of Texas reckon that saved consumers about $300 million. A similar program in New South Wales saved around 3% of electricity demand in 2013. And ISO New England, which covers six US states, <clears throat> has found that demand reduction is much more reliable than power stations at times of system stress. 98% of uh, megawatts delivered when the system needed them to keep the lights on versus 72% of fast start power generators. Uh, bluntly, megawatts are better at keeping the lights on than coal. <clears throat> Point two, it's way cheaper than the alternative. Uh, new UK power stations cost at least 75 pounds per megawatt hour, and that's gas and renewables um, and nuclear. Uh, existing power costs about £50 per megawatt hour, and energy saving at scale costs between £25 and £40 per megawatt hour, and that's based on US and Australian experience. <clears throat> but policy is just supporting expensive generation and not supporting uh, cheap and low carbon megawatts. If the UK deployed its realistic potential for megawatts, uh, by 2025, we'd save about £2.4 billion per year. That's net of the costs of paying for megawatts. Uh, and if we did that through the levy control framework, which we think is the, the obvious way of doing it, it would bring the net impact of the levy control framework down from around 10 billion to about 6.6 .6 billion. That's a big saving on people's bills. Uh, deploying megawatts in the capacity market would be the cheapest way of uh, cutting coal out of the system. We reckon if you push things, you could get about 6 gigawatts of demand reduction by 2023 versus about 8.5 gigawatts of coal in the system today. And that's against a technical potential of 18 gigawatts, so we don't think we're being unrealistic. The third point is we think it will spur innovation uh, because paying for megawatts creates uh, or supports businesses uh, who can make more money by saving more energy more effectively than their competitors. And we think there are two types of innovation that might uh, arise. The first is technical innovation. We've already seen this happen. Demand response companies like Kiwi Power and Demand Logic are less than a decade old, and they've already got about a power station's worth of demand response uh, helping to keep the lights on, which they've made happen through a combination of IT and and control systems, which is all interesting new technology, nice technical innovation there. And all this all came about because of a relatively small balancing market created by National Grid. The second sort of innovation we think is more important for this market, and that's business model innovation. The reason consumers don't save electricity is because it, does, it isn't because it doesn't make financial sense. It does, but it's because consumers don't act like spreadsheets. Um, we know there's a decade's worth of, of evidence that the barriers to energy efficiency are about hassle, they're about upfront cost, the low priority that consumers give to energy issues, because bluntly, most consumers aren't energy geeks, this audience accepted. Uh, lack of knowledge, poor integration in the supply chain, all those sorts of things. Uh, businesses are really good at solving these problems if they have a profit motive to do so. Uh, and we think that the core competency of an efficiency business supported by a feed-in tariff would be to address these problems and to compete with their competitors to do so better. So finally, the uh, most efficiency policy is focused on heat, um, and paying for megawatts would address the 45% of your bill, which is for, down to electricity. And I reckon if we wanted to, we could also adapt this policy for heat as well. Thanks very much. That's the kickoff. Um, there's a distinction, obviously, between demand-side response and demand-side reduction, demand-side reduction being something which is permanent and therefore needs to be verifiable. Um, and uh, my uh, concern about this policy, which also is, I think, a very attractive policy uh, in terms of uh, the the really substantial impact it could have 
um, if, it, if it works uh, properly, uh, would be that are we really going to get, uh, in terms of an approach to uh, individual households, individual properties, probably I guess through aggregators, a, uh, a, a, a real and verifiable uh, reduction uh, in demand on the basis of the feed-in tariff uh, and or energy efficiency tariff. And unless we can say that we really are going to do that, then it seems to me that the, the problem of burgeoning bureaucracy um, at the back of all this, it, it looks to be uh, quite enormous. And indeed, uh, I would suggest that was one of the things that sunk the Green Deal uh, in terms of the extent to which you had to put things on the back of various other things in order to verify that the first thing had taken place and that your feed-in tariff, which is out the window and gone, um, uh, wouldn't be a regrets policy in as much as as soon as the spotlight was turned off the energy reduction of the particular householder, the energy, would, the energy use would go up again. So how would one get uh, a position where uh, the policy really was verifiable and really was something that you could say um, uh, would tick the box in terms of the savings that you thought you were going to make as opposed to the savings you actually did? This is a tough challenge, uh, and I think it applies to all sorts of energy saving. I mean, the, the same is true for the Green Deal, any kind of mechanism. Uh, most of what we do is, is deemed savings. So we'll say if you install a bit of insulation or if you get a more energy efficient appliance, we know that you're likely to consume less energy, and so we, we deem it. There are kind of two other mechanisms which uh, the Americans have invented for us, which I think would be helpful. The first is measuring the savings uh, against a weather-adjusted baseline from a previous year. And this is the sort of thing you wouldn't want to do at a household level. You'd need an aggregator to do this across their portfolio. Uh, so you'd, you'd reward the, the aggregator, and the, they would be responsible for the measurement and verification. And the second, uh, that approach is good, but it doesn't necessarily account for changes in households. So if your kids go off to university or something like that, they might take their Xbox with them, and you uh, therefore lose that source of demand for free. Um, the, or, well, for the cost of university, I should say. Um, <coughs> the, the second way is a bit more robust, and that's to use measurement against a, a statistically similar control group. So you get a group of households that look like your household. You measure them. You don't give them energy efficiency measures. You give your efficiency measures to your, uh, to your measurement group, and you compare the savings across that portfolio. Uh, OPAR has done this in the United States. They've got some peer-reviewed papers on it, which... Uh, suggest both to US regulators and to the academic community that it's good enough. Uh, there's always going to be uncertainty here, let's be absolutely clear, uh, but let's count what the costs of that uncertainty are. So we looked at a, a California program uh, which looked at lighting bulb replacement and said, you know, they give you a bit of money if you buy your energy efficient light bulb instead of your non-energy efficient light bulb. They did a post hoc study and found that 50% of the light bulbs would have been bought anyway. And they thought, gosh, well, this was a bit of a waste of time, wasn't it? But then they ran the numbers. And even discounting half the money was wasted, they still found the total cost of the program was 20 pounds per megawatt hour. So even though there was this additionality problem, it was still so cheap that it's way better than building a gas power station or a wind turbine or whatever power you want. Um, way cheaper to do savings. But, I mean, the, 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 the light bulb example is, uh, is certainly an, an example of of things that are installed which are in themselves verifiably demand-side uh, reduction. Uh, I think the issue arises rather more with the uh, sort of experiments that have been carried out in terms of measuring um, energy use at, at the beginning of a certain period, aggregating the saving um, over a certain period and then claiming something back after it. And it does seem to be uh, potentially uh, a, in that particular area, a program which would perhaps give some demand uh, re side response over a period, but actually would not necessarily stick once the, the second part of the verification had been completed, uh, unless you do stick indeed to things which uh, you know are independent of individuals. Well, th th there's and, another aspect uh, of the verification there. as well, because not only does the, if you like, the the, the body that's supervising this, the government or whatever, need to be verified. But each individual householder mm. needs to be verified as well. They need to, that you, you're going to get reward. You want to get reward for the behaviour that you yourself has done. So, yeah, it, it does seem very 
bureaucratic in the sort of business. It, it depends on the business model that the aggregator chooses. So they might choose to incentivize you by giving you a payment, or they might just say, we guarantee you'll save 10% on your energy bill, and they take the payment in order to cover the costs of doing the, the M&V and finding and perhaps helping to buy you a measure up front. So it doesn't necessarily be, need to be done at household level. And I'd argue that we want some innovation here. We want different companies to choose different ways of incentivizing people, because that's what businesses are good at. They're good at figuring out you know, what makes a customer think, oh, well, energy efficiency is a hassle, but actually it's not that much of a hassle. Um, we should be seeking innovation there. And uh, as to your point about behavioral programs, I mean, O-Power basically, in, in the nicest possible way, puts smiley faces on your bill if you save more energy than your neighbors. And it apparently works. I mean, you know, they've got lots of MNV that says it's about 2% of electricity savings. I don't know where that sticks around. If we don't find that credible, maybe we can have more MNV for them and less MNV for, you know, refrigerator replacement or something. One other question. Um, you talked about the LCF, and obviously that, that's a very important uh, topic at the moment. But it seems to me, if you're doing a sort of crude ballpark, let's compare this with renewables, for example, we're you know, getting towards the stage, depending on what happens in the next few years, where a lot of renewables won't need support. So there might not be an LCF, but it seems to me with this, you would need to keep the LCF going almost in perpetuity in order to garner the rewards from it. Uh, yep, you would. Um, the, I guess the choice. This is trying to impose a, a sort of system rational way of thinking. So procure the least cost stuff before you procure a new generation, because consumers are very disconnected from the wholesale market decisions. That uh, I mean, my contention is that if you had an LCF for megawatts over a period of time, it would reduce the total cost of the bill, and that's what consumers care about. I don't think they make too much of a distinction between what government's levying versus what gas companies are, are making, for example. They're just happy to see their bills go down. So, yeah, but I mean, if you ran it for a decade and then you decided you didn't need any more LCF and you got lots of megawatts, well, maybe there's a better policy after that. But if we get a, deg a, a, a decade worth of megawatts out of this, I'll be a happy man. One question for me. Is this about permanent... It follows up on Alan's point, really. Is this about permanent demand reduction or is it about demand-side response? Because I think that's where the, the pilot that was run, the, the electricity demand reduction pilot, was slightly confused about exactly what it was. Was it about permanent reduction or peak time? And, and it was, some companies found it difficult to engage with the fact that it was peak time only. So w which, of, which of those is this? I would say it's both, but you use different mechanisms. So we have a capacity mechanism, and that's for peak time reduction. And I think if you can provide reduction over peak, whether that's reduction all the time or just over peak, you should be able to bid into that market. And if you're reducing demand permanently in the same way that a nuclear power station provides power continuously, then you should be able to compete with that nuclear power station. That's a good question. How are you going to market this and deliver this to consumers because uh, one of the challenges is actually actually making the getting the uptake um, and I, I don't really you know, it sounds great but relatively uh, challenging you know even with a very simple uh, scheme but how do you take it out to the market or to the consumer to deliver it well, the most honest answer is that I have no idea. I'm not a businessman. I, <laughs> I work for a think tank. But what I do know is that there are clever businesses out there that are doing this. So I mentioned two of them, Demand Logic and Kiwi Power. They've gone out to businesses. They found companies that wouldn't otherwise. This is just demand response, not demand reduction, to be clear. But they found companies who are willing to switch off the refrigerators or change the load profile of their air conditioning units or that because they, you know, they, they've done the sort of business side of things. And there are similar examples in the United States. Efficiency Vermont, which is not a private company, it's a state-run one, has found that they can engage people on this. And I think we should allow for experimentation in the market. I certainly don't have all the answers. Right, there's time for one question. Peter. Uh, Peter, the Combatant Energy Action. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, Mrs. Miggins is already paying for large energy industrial users' uh, share of um, policy costs. What? Um, it's just why? Why should she also pay for Marks and Spencers to chill their sandwiches cheap? So this is the distributional question. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, again, it's a problem with all energy levy policies, so it's not unique to this. It's, it's the same for renewables or nuclear or carbon capture and storage um, or whatever, or indeed the capacity mechanism. Um, the way in which this problem has been addressed in the U.S. is that you pay more for energy savings for people in fuel poverty. And what that does is incentivizes aggregators to go and find people who are in fuel poverty and deliver energy efficiency measures. So this is clearly a social policy. I think it's a good thing. It's, it's a, a sort of a slightly different question 
question than the actual policy itself, but you might pay, if you're paying two pence per kilowatt hour for energy savings across the market, you pay two and a half or three cents per kilowatt hour for energy saving and fuel poverty. And we do that because it's the socially just thing to do. And one more very quick question. Just coming in, a, a response to Alan, but a measurement verification question. <coughs> Stephen Heath Canal Installation, just to come in on the measurement and verification question, it's an engineering solution. <coughs> Drive innovation by, if there is one technology, whether it be light bulbs, that it works, well, the next step is to say, come to us with your meter, and you can then come in on, that, uh, on the platform of feed-in tariffs. It would drive innovation, and it would then also come up to the marketing question, because once you've got light bulbs, you can then drive even heat um, reduction or uh, appliance swapping out. So it's a engineering problem, drive the innovation through this policy idea. Okay. I think we're going to have to wrap up there and move on. So thank you, thank Dustin. You. We'll now hear from Richard Griffiths, who's Senior Policy and Business Development um, Advisor at UK Green Building Council, um, where he covers domestic and non-domestic energy efficiency policy, and he will be pitching an idea around green mortgages. First of all, I'd just like to say it's really nice to um, have an opportunity to argue with some of these guys. Most of the time, I nauseatingly spend my time agreeing with them. So uh, thanks very much for giving me that opportunity um, to uh, policy exchange. It's also really good to hear uh, both David and Dustin pushing ideas that I think were at least fairly highly profiled in a, a retrofit incentives report that we put out a little while ago. So if you want a summary of the event, read that. Um, <coughs> So uh, a year and a half ago, uh, I spent a lot of time locked in a room with a lot of the people in, uh, uh, in this room today, look, thinking quite depressingly about the fact that the Green Deal wasn't going anywhere fast, and we just had David Cameron labelling energy efficiency charges on uh, energy bills as green crap that he wanted to get rid of. And it was around that time that I read something that was quite fortunate in the... Um, well, in a number of tabloid newspapers, but also I looked at and, and, and read about in the Financial Times. I'll just I'll read, read, you, read you that today. So it says, three-hour interviews, inquisitions into spending on betting and gambling, forensic examination of bank statements and salary slips. It's not an investigation into organised financial crime, but the ordeal, according to some tabloid accounts at least, that borrowers will face to get a mortgage. Now, reading that made me think about the fact that, well, what is it that... Uh, mortgage providers actually should be looking at um, if they're going to be combing through financial uh, in, through your financial details ahead of giving you a mortgage actually you know what are the big ticket items they should be spending their money on and as we all know energy efficient or energy is very much uh, in that area of, of big household expenditure it accounts for seven percent of uh, average uh, UK disposable income and that's certainly more than I spend on gambling, pants and haircuts, which were some of the things that came up in um, uh, tabloid articles on this. <coughs> anyway, uh, off the back of that, I approached the bank and made the case that maybe energy efficiency or energy uh, is something that sh they should be accounting for a bit better in their energy um, or in their affordability calculations. And they said, sounds great in principle, but you know, make, make the case to us with numbers. So we went away and did that and looked at how banks actually currently calculate um, energy costs as part of their affordability calculations, and the answer is they don't. They use a general measure for household expenditure, which is based on a combination of household size, income, and location. And as a result of that, they have a very crude approximation within overall expenditure of what expenditure on energy um, might be. So we looked at that in some more detail. We took... Thousands of, house, uh, thousands of houses worth of data with UCL looking at actually what um, could be done to, to improve that calculation methodology. And it turns out that by adding energy performance uh, certificate rating, property type, uh, age and size, you could more than double the explanatory power of the variables that um, banks currently use to estimate bills when they're working out mortgage affordability. Also, by taking that approach, you not only uh, degree, uh, um, look at the expansion or, or match up the expansion power at the, at the middle, you're, you also match the distribution of bills much, much better. So it means that at the extreme ends, very, very energy efficient properties or very energy inefficient properties are currently almost totally ignored in the way that banks deal with these calculations. Uh, 
but are very well uh, accounted for if you take a slightly more sophisticated approach. We do, in running the numbers on that, it, just for very, very normal houses, so a standard new build and a very, very typical um, not, uh, sort of Victorian terrace property, we found that banks were over lending, by, oh, sorry, under lending by something like £45,000 in terms of life, uh, lifetime mortgage costs to a new build home and under lending even to a really, really quite sort of standard house uh, at the other end of the scale by about 11500 And if you think from a bank's perspective, they're actually treating those properties because all the other characteristics were the same. Um, the, the difference between those houses is, is enormous, but they would be treated from a lender perspective currently as exactly the same. So the advantage here is that if we can persuade banks to make a small tweak to the way in which they calculate later, calculate affordability, you can have a very significant effect on the market. Obviously, if you start to lend more against um, energy-efficient homes and less against energy-inefficient homes, which would be the rational response of lenders to taking this approach, you would have very quickly an impact on values, which, like stamp duty, would buy at point of sale in particular, which is a great time to influence energy efficiency decisions you would have um, a greater role for EPCs. Now, EPCs are currently not the greatest tool, but if all of a sudden your mortgage started depending on what your EPC rating was, you'd start to get people paying for and recognising the value of EPCs, which would create a virtuous circle. Uh, linked to what David was saying and, and uh, building on the point about impact on values, one of the most important things that we can possibly do is to get people like Kirsty and Phil talking about the fact that it's not just by... Uh, installing, wooden uh, install installing wooden floors that you can add value to your house. If you can get part of that conversation, again, you know, repeating what David said, as being you can add value to this property by lagging the loft, then that's a fantastic thing. Um, and you can be damn sure that people would be doing that if their banks told them to. But the absolute winner, the thing that I think is going to have me laughing all the way to the door with the bottle of champagne at the end of this, is the fact that we don't actually require any policy to do this. In the current context, in current context of things of deregulation, and actually the fact that government doesn't really have, or at least claims not to have, a great deal of money to uh, spend on these things, the fact that all we, the only people we need to persuade are the banks is a fantastic thing, and we don't actually need them or the government to part with any money to do that. In fact, it's just enlightened self-interest that would make them do it. If you look at some of the evidence around this from the US, uh, uh, some research that was put out a year or two ago by the Institute for Market Transformation showed that default risk associated with energy efficient homes was 32% lower than their inefficient peers. So this isn't something that they would be doing because they love the planet or because they want to uh, do good things for energy efficiency. They'd just be doing it because it makes good business sense. And as a result of that, uh, it's already something that's starting to attract interests of lenders as well. Uh, we already have a project that's following on from our initial study on this that's going to be, um, that features Principality and Nationwide Building Society. And Nationwide, as you probably all know, are a huge lender in the UK. They're already very interested in this. And we have a uh, link to that. Now we have a workshop in a, in a couple, of day, uh, couple of days' time with number 10. So it's already starting to influence at the highest levels within government as well. So in terms of picking something a, a, amongst these... Um, candidates that could actually go and has some legs already we're already there um i think that's probably it for now I'm, i dare say many other things i could say will come up in question so i'll stop there thank you just looking at the existing lending criteria um for uh, taking out a mortgage um they've already been considerably tightened up uh, upon in recent years and I'm just wondering how you would see this sitting alongside that because um, this is I think this idea has a lot of merit I think there's a lot of, a lot of benefit from it but it, you know if those other existing criteria which fundamentally look at people's income disposable income and those issues as they as they're spending their money today not how they may be when they move into a new home um, that is the primary driver for a lot of mortgage companies in setting their mortgages, and that's governed to some extent by some of the new mortgage rules that have come in. So I just wondered how you would see this sitting alongside that and whether uh, it, it, would, it, would, it would be able to, in that context, drive change. 
Um, well, I, I think it's part of that. I mean, as, as I said, that, you know, the reason why this came up in my mind in the first place was reading about those new rules. Um, obviously, the mortgage market review was brought in to deal with irresponsible lending. And when uh, banks were thinking about what they could do to be more responsible, uh, more responsible as lenders, they uh, started introducing rules around, you know, looking at household expenditure and so on. Unfortunately, or you know, maybe fortunately for, for me having a job, they don't really understand these things particularly well when it comes to energy. Uh, so, I, I think playing uh, us, you know, and the people in this room playing a role in helping them to understand actually the fact that there is something they can do that's quite easy and quite substantial in meeting the rules that they're already required to exist, uh, already required to comply with. Sorry. Uh, you know, this is just very much part of that process. So all I, I would be, uh, all, all, all I'm suggesting really is that we can play a role in facilitating them doing something that they're required to do already. But just, 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 just quickly though, I mean, on that, I mean, one of the things that a lender will do is, and if you're going to lender, they'll say, look, this is how you are now. So how do I know you're going to be like that when you change your circumstances? You're saying your circumstances are going to change. But as a lender, they have to look at people as they are now and what their current outgoings are. So that, that's kind of the challenge on this from a mortgage but, lender's perspective. But, well, I, I mean, I, I think, think at, well, um, I, I work a discussion on this, really, but this is probably one of the areas where you can be a bit more steely on that, actually, because although, you know, we can't predict what people are going to do in terms of their behavioural uh, impacts on energy use in a household actually the, the, the modelling part of this process is looking at the house they're about to buy and the characteristics of that house. So, it, so you can actually make a prediction about, the, about some element, a significant element of the money they might be spending on energy. So that forward look is actually strengthened by taking this approach. You're not taking a guess at what people might do. You're actually making a, a pretty well-informed forecast. Although I get the rationale of the, the idea, it's quite attractive in some way. There's one, it strikes me there's one in a sense, perversity uh, in the design. And actually, you know, people who are in um, non-energy energy efficient or homes with poor energy, uh, energy efficiency would be getting fewer resources out of this. And yet, arguably, that's where you want the resources to be concentrated because that's where you need the change to occur. So I, I want, is there some more sophisticated version of this where, you know, a, a little bit like the... Um, the idea of the year after you buy the house, you can have the stamp duty rebate where you can actually fund, you give people an option. Well, here's, here's an extra pot of money which you can use, but if you don't, we'll have it back or, or whatever it might be like. Um, written at the bottom of my sheet here is mortgage advance. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So the log logical extension of this, because it doesn't just have to relate to the point of sale. So as a, as a bank, you can say, well, you know, we'll lend you more against an energy-efficient house and lend you less against an energy-efficient house, but you can also say, we will give you an advance if you promise to spend some of that money on an energy-inefficient house and improving that house. And actually, if you look at um, Nationwide, so who I mentioned just now is one of the supporters of the kind of ongoing project on this, uh, already offer a, uh, now I'm going to struggle to think of the name of it, but it's a green mortgage advance service where you can get um, a reduction of... Uh, uh, I, don't, I can't remember, it's like 50 basis points or you know, half, a, half a percent on, on your mortgage rate to take out up to an additional, I think it's 20, 25,000 pounds to uh, undertake energy efficiency improvements. And as a lender, when you're looking at actually the lifetime cost of that house and the affordability of that house and the affordability of the mortgage, that's a very rational thing to do. Uh, and there's also some examples of that happening el elsewhere in the world. And of course, you know, you, you've got... Um, uh, some of the smaller, more niche lenders like the Ecology Building Society that do this kind of thing already. So I think absolutely, you know, there's, there's, I don't think you have that problem of um, uh, inefficient homes being stuck because of this kind of policy. Just one more question, same question I asked David actually. Have you modelled the actual impact of this nationwide? Uh, we haven't yet. We, uh, one of the great get-out clauses I have standing here today is the fact that we've, we've got an 18-month uh, Innovate UK um, funded project which is going to look into some of the more detail uh, or some more of the detail on this but one of the things that's great that you have to think about is um, and this again applies to David Stamp Duty Land Tax is if you start to influence property prices which I think is a very logical extension of this approach it will affect every house in the UK you know I can, as somebody that works on home retrofit I can pack up and go home and, and forget about my job and you know, retire to Hawaii as soon as property prices start to reflect energy efficiency, because if that happens, 
you can bet your bottom dollar that pretty much every house pretty quickly will become a lot more energy efficient than it is today. So I'm, I'm very, very confident that the benefit of this is strong. I can, I can see um, uh, that we could have a, a, an interesting change in behaviour instead of you know, putting the coffee beans on the grill um, when you're having the people coming around to look at the house. You have some NAF insulation materials hanging around. <laughs> Other, 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 comp other companies' insulation is available. I okay, okay. Sorry, I'm going to one company. Um, <laughs> I mean, my, my, following on the distribution point, my, my sort of worry uh, on this would be that uh, you've got to put a lot of store on the benign intentions of mortgage lenders. Um, and I worry that you would you might end up having a situation where you had effectively redlined areas of the country for mortgage purposes. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily be the fault of the individual household. It would be the fault of the particular um, background of the stock. I mean, uh, I don't wish to point to any particular places, but say Blackburn with its you know, huge proportion of um, non-cavity wall uh, houses. Um, I, can, I can see mortgage companies saying, well, actually, well, let's give them a hard time because uh, under the new criteria, um, pretty, pretty likely none of these will qualify uh, in, the, in, in, in the way that we want them to qualify. And then you presumably would have to put an area uplift program in to, to, to get them out of the red line um, that they've been put in in the first place. So to what extent do you think that might backfire in terms of how uh, companies might ev eventually see this as, a, as uh, yet another relatively easy way um, to grade their, their lending as opposed to the, um, uh, the, the purpose that you would want it to happen, which is a fairly fine-grained um, pull system as far as energy efficiency is concerned. I mean, yeah, I, th I think there's always a risk there in that yeah, it could have some unintended consequences, and I think it's important that we look at those. I don't think you would be seeing enormous changes in terms of the, the, the value of property. And, and it would be, as you say, just one of the things that lenders would be doing probably quite sensibly. I mean, from the point of view of those people in, in Blackburn, it's probably fairly good for them to know at the point of buying a new property that they are facing costs of occupation that are higher than it would be if they bought a more energy inefficient property. So, I mean, there are benefits to consumers in terms of the kind of signals that this would provide, um, as well as um, drawbacks as well. So, in, in, in answer to your question, I think seeing how this plays out, um, you know, is something we'd have to be quite careful of. And, of course, as David said as well, the absolutely critical thing in all of these, uh, with all of these kind of policies, is they must not work in isolation. If you've got areas of the country where you've got very poor housing, there should be programs in place uh, that deal with that, including free insulation programs for, for, for poor homes or street-by-street street insulation programs for large areas that don't have uh, cavity walls, that kind of thing. So although I would say that there is a risk here, I think it also provides an opportunity to have some pretty substantial and fairly powerful complementary policies in place. Great. I think we're going to have to move on. Apologies, no time for audience Q&A on this, but thank you, Richard. I'll now welcome Simon Roberts, who's Chief Executive of the Centre for Sustainable Energy, which is a charity which um, many of you will be familiar with, um, which promotes sustainable and affordable energy, um, and he'll be pitching an idea um, of placing an obligation on suppliers, um, a demand reduction obligation on suppliers. Yeah, thank you, and uh, good morning. Um, first thing I'd say to the uh, Dragons is we do need a multitude of policies to stimulate investment in energy efficiency <coughs> in the domestic sector. So like any good investor, you should be committing to a balanced portfolio of, uh, of uh, rather than pick one. But if you do want a winner, what I'm proposing today is one <laughs> very specific and very simple policy which focuses on changing the way energy suppliers do their business and, most importantly, which aligns their business futures and their trajectories with the purpose and the behaviours that they show with the broader thrust of government policy and, most importantly, with the energy efficient, low-demand future that we need and which every policy is predicated on. What we're proposing is what we and uh, DEC are now calling the demand reduction obligation, 
or DRO. And if you want to read more about this, there's a, you just go onto our website, cse.org.uk, and search for Beyond the Eco. And you should also read Beyond the Eco and Beyond, because we were channeling Buzz Lightyear in uh, the follow-up for that. But what this policy requires is that energy suppliers reduce year on year the average energy consumption of the domestic customer base, both electricity and gas. Very simple, easily measured, outcome-based obligation that reduces average demand amongst their customers. Now, the DRO would be the next step in a 20-year history of obligations on energy suppliers to do something about domestic energy saving. You've had ESOP 1, ESOP 2, ESOP 3, EEC 1, EEC 2, CERT and ECO, a veritable acronym soup. But uh, they all build on a simple underlying rationale, market failure. And those of us old enough, and there are some in the room, to have been arguing with Stephen Littlechild at Offer and Claire Spottiswood at Offgas in the early 1990s will know actually that's a very simple argument and ultimately a convincing argument that leads to the introduction and intervention with an obligation. So what is this market failure? In a competitive domestic energy market, the market's failing if there are unrealised opportunities to save energy in the customer's home that are cheaper than the market cost of supplying that energy to the home. There have been such opportunities in the past, and most of the obligations have focused on getting those realised, and there are still many opportunities. But what's changed is what those opportunities now are. They're different to the ones available in the past, and they therefore need a different obligation to get energy suppliers to focus on them and sh shift their practice. There are three discontinuities from what we've had in the past. The first is, as a result, principally of the success of those past obligations, we've kind of done the low-cost, easy energy efficiency measures. Cavities and lofts, by the end of ECO, they'll be more or less done, and the ones that haven't been done probably will never get done unless we introduce some of these other policies people have been talking about, because these are refused nicks. These are people who've been offered it five, six times for nothing and not done it yet. So these aren't easy measures. They're difficult measures because of the hassle. So there aren't things to low-cost insulation measures to obligate suppliers to do. The second discontinuity is the emergence of a data-rich, smart uh, opportunities as a result of the introduction of smart meters that potentially transform the opportunities for householders to understand their energy use, but also other services to use that data to support more efficient behaviour. And the third one is there's been a stream of technological improvements, particularly around lighting, but also appliances and heating controls, which means there's been a proliferation of lower-cost energy-saving measures, which currently have been excluded from the obligation. So we need a demand reduction obligation to bring those opportunities forward and correct the market failure. Now, this moves away from what we've done in previous obligations, which is tell the energy suppliers to install a certain number of measures. That's effectively what all the things have been done in the past. Instead, we've just got an easy, easily measured, outcome-based approach that leaves energy suppliers to choose the interventions to stimulate real reductions in their customers' demand. We're not that interested in how they've done it. We're interested in whether it's happened or not. It removes the need for this amazing bureaucracy we've got now to pre-qualify or disqualify measures which count towards obligations, to work out what the estimated savings will be and deem them so that they can be counted, and to monitor whether installations have happened. None of that matters anymore, because all that matters is what the customer's demand is at the end. And what this DRO does is start to align energy suppliers' interests with the success of other key policy objectives, that broader shift in the energy market in the way we use energy that we're trying to achieve. So the introduction of smart meters, which are relying on customers responding in terms of the business case, suddenly it makes energy suppliers really interested in making that work. The improved standards in energy efficient appliances depend on people taking those appliances into their home, not simply the standards being upped. Improvements in lighting likewise. So introducing a DRO not only changes the relationship between suppliers and their customers, it also it reduces policy risk in these other areas, which currently don't have obvious actors to drive them forward. So such an obligation that goes directly with the grain of the transformation in business models that we need from energy suppliers towards this lower, more responsive domestic demand that we need, need more broadly. It gives energy suppliers a direct business interest in helping their own customers, again, a different from previous obligations, to achieve real energy savings in their homes. And it focuses energy, uh, energy suppliers on those low-cost 
energy saving interventions and, and activities that engage their customers with reducing energy consumption. That will lower overall system cost and as a result it would lead to lower bills. The other interesting thing it does is increase the market attractiveness to suppliers of lower than average consumption households. Because if you acquire more of those, your average consumption across your customer base goes down. And since lower than average consumption households tend to be lower than average income, you get some interesting potential shifts in the market, progressively, potentially progressive. So what do we think suppliers would do faced with a DRO? We think they'd start making the most of smart metered data on behalf of their customers. We think they'd help their customers take up LEDs, more efficient appliances, promote behaviour change, improved heating controls. We think they would encourage their customers to do housing retrofit, but they'd probably back away from doing direct subsidy. And we think they'd develop tariffs which would reward customers which reduced, who reduce demand, which, in my mind, is exactly what we want a modern energy supplier to be doing. My question to you is, would this happen unless we bring in an obligation to get it to, to take it forward. I don't think the current crop of energy suppliers will do this left to their own devices, given the market failure. So let's give them and us the benefit of a demand reduction obligation and set them free. Thank you. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so I have one quick question, which is essentially about rebound effects. How do you deal with that? So the idea that you could go in, the company could be paying for measures here and there, but if what that results in is people turning up the heating and enjoying a warmer home, you won't actually see a demand reduction, but the measures will have been done. How do you deal with that? In well, like, what I've done is outsource that problem to all the energy suppliers. Yes. I because, in effect, that. they have to worry about that. And at the moment, they get points for installing cavity wall insulation without worrying about whether there's a thermostat on the heating and, therefore, the house gets overheated as a result of the insulation, they still get the same energy savings because we've deemed the savings. This means they become very interested in whether those measures actually work in the households that they've installed them with and they will work and incentivise households to take full advantage of them. So it changes that dynamic completely away from, you know, you put that in, you've got these points, to you are become very interested as an energy supplier through all the partnerships you've developed to, make, to getting households to actually reduce demand and you become less interested in a way in exactly how you've done that, but you make sure that those things you've done work. Part of government policy is to encourage people to switch suppliers. Mm -hmm. So for something like this, who, who is going to be my energy supplier? Who, who's the obligation going to be on if I'm switching every six months? It goes on to any, all the energy suppliers. So and what for you could... Six months, well, for my six months, one, one has to do it, and then the next I switch suppliers, and then the next one has to do it. Oh, well, well, you move your energy demand to your new supplier, so that changes their overall average. So you basically become part of their pool that they've got to reduce demand over. So if you've already done demand reduction, you become quite interesting to them. If you've got a huge potential to reduce demand, and they think they can stimulate you with some behavioural interventions, you also become quite interesting to them. So it kind of changes the way they look at their customers. They actually start to become interested in who their customers are and the way they're using energy. So I think um, if you impose it on all customers, you could also benchmark it, so you basically produce a league table that shows who's reducing their customer demand by more. You could even use that as a mechanism for moving money from the least well-performing to the best, but also that could have some interesting market effects as well in terms of which, which suppliers are looking like the ones that want to help you reduce your bills, reduce your energy demand more than others. What's the sanction on companies if they don't do this? Well, you could do what there is at the moment under the obligation, which is up to 10% of turnover fine. My suspicion is that would be quite difficult because one of the challenges with it is calibrating the target to set because it's happening in a world where there are all these other policies going on. So one of the things we've been thinking about is whether you could benchmark, just use a benchmark, you basically just say, we want to see how it's done. We publish a league table year on year, and we see which ones are high, which ones are low. You could potentially move money, as I say, between the bottom and the top as a kind of reward for the people who overperform, set around the average, and a, re reward for the, a penalty for those. And my suspicion is that a chief finance officer would much rather write a cheque to Ofgem for its fines than it would write a cheque to a chief financial officer of another energy supplier. I could, I could see a new switching campaign developing of energy companies going round to certain houses and offering them incentives not to be their customer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm not sure that would be... 
Well, it's interesting because the people they wouldn't want as customers would be profligate energy users who tend to be the better off people who've got the most opportunity and, and uh, ability to change their behaviours. And you would also expect, if that was happening, that some new entrants would see that as a niche that they could come into and do something very different with. Because this potentially opens up completely different business models in terms of the relationship between a supplier and their customer, where demand reduction, energy services become what you're offering, not, not uh, supply. Be profligate energy limited and insurgent. You know. Well, they would have a target as well uh, to reduce demand. So they could, even if they took them on, they'd still have a target to reduce that average demand across their customer base. So what you might end up with is a weird company that has very profligate people and very uh, energy efficient people and tries to kind of balance it out like that. But it would change the way that suppliers look at people in the market and the sorts of incentives and offers and services that they would be prepared to offer because they'd be looking to acquire customers with lower than average, their current average demand. By using their average demand, you also deal with all these geographical and kind of climate, climate, you know, kind of different weather patterns because you're looking at the current customer base and how it changes over, over a given year rather than worrying about uh, trying to set a single average for everyone. Would you set the same obligation on all energy companies, so bigger and smaller companies, um, and would you, how would you deal with new entrants to the market in, uh, and encouraging new entrants to the market in, in this new model? Well, I think this creates a very interesting opportunity for new entrants because suddenly you come in where you're, the, the sorts of things you can do with smart meters become part of a supply package rather than simply a kind of add-on bells and whistles for people with smartphone apps or whatever. Um, but I also think uh, you would, I would set it across every energy supplier that they had an obligation year on year to reduce the average of their customer base. And you probably need to think about how you deal with people whose customer base is growing significantly but I think you still work on the same basis, that you take a date and it's the average from that period forward in terms of what you've done, and you take the same customer base through, through the next year. Um, and it, I think it would have a very dramatic effect on the way that suppliers think about their relationship with their customer, um, and they'd use that smart energy data, which at the moment, I'm very concerned, won't get used systematically across the customer base of, of the, or the, the households of the country, um, it'll be used for a small group of tech-savvy people rather than used as a kind of routine, which is what the anticipated impacts and benefits are in, in the uh, index uh, impact assessment. Okay, it's time for a couple of qu quick questions. Uh, Richard. Why would you like for like rather than this sort of app totally cool? Sorry? I didn't like for like. So you, you, you look at what you have and you see not to move yourself towards more, less profligate users, but... Uh, Go like for like. So if I'm a sinner, if I go down by 10%, surely that would be better than the energy company moving from um, you know, a large number of profligates to a, 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 the same number of less. But I had an interesting conversation with energy suppliers. We said, well, it would just be all these low consumers, we're all low energy consumers, we're all chasing after them. Well, A, brilliant, but also that's a zero-sum game. So you will actually have to do some stuff with your existing customer base to reduce their demand. So there is this interesting effect it will have in the way they present to the market to seek to acquire customers and to avoid losing customers that are good for their average. Uh, but that's, that all seems like a very positive thing. So I, I would expect the main focus will be on their existing customer base given the levels of churn. You know, it's not, not high. So you need, you know, if 90% if of your customers are still your customers year on year... You've got to do some stuff with them uh, to, to hit these, the, the targets. And if you're benchmarked, you'll want to do better than the others. You'll certainly want to do better than average if you've got to shift money from the worse than average to the better than average. There's a question here. Josh Robson from Canal Insulation. Um, a couple of quick questions which I know have come up before in relation to this. Um, first of all, when do you visit this coming up? Because I think it's probably quite reliant on smart meters, which perhaps will not be installed in the... Uh, immediate future and secondly given that smart miss will be one of the key elements of it do you think that the outcome will probably just be price related changes rather than actual demand reduction within homes okay there's two one is you could do this now we could just say we're going to start benchmarking the suppliers and publish it that pilots it you just do it it's not complicated you use the estimate you know the bill reading on the 31st of december whatever they've submitted to Alexon gets used that won't be fully accurate for any individual customer, but on average it's accurate. So you could use that 
If it's benchmarked and you're not really moving money around at this time, you just see how quickly it becomes fully accurate when you start doing, going through the kind of settlement process and getting it accurate. So um, <clears throat> you could do it now. You could even retrospectively look at what it was like in the past because DEC has that data. So you could, that benchmark, that league table, I think it's the way you pilot it. You just start doing the benchmark, announce you're going to do it from January onwards and, and see what happens. Uh, and I think you might have some interesting market effects at that point. Uh, what was the second part of your question, sorry? Smart meters. Uh, that's an argument I, I uh, reject. I don't think you need smart meters to do this. I think it will add another tool that suppliers could, would be able to start to use. It may make them more interested in starting to get smart meters in properly and quickly and at SMETS2 uh, accurately uh, because it creates that tool. In fact, it may be useful to introduce it before they've got all the smart meters in. But the idea that we, across a customer base... Their estimated readings are so poor, there's a wild variation, and therefore we couldn't use the estimated readings across the customer base, is inaccurate. They're, the estimated readings that they produce for Alexon don't get used for settlement because for any individual customer, they're wrong if they're estimated. You don't know how wrong, but and, uh, interestingly, Alexon don't know how wrong and never look at that. But across their customer base, their estimates are pretty much pretty reliable. So it kind of, you don't need smart meters to do it, it adds another tool and it would make them more interested in getting smart meters in and doing the right things when you get it in so that you secure that engagement quickly and, and promptly. We are going to have to wrap up there because it's done and um, have to go in just a minute. But so thank you Simon. Thank you. So we're just going to give some um, a brief summary, each, um, starting with Dan. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you to all uh, for uh, the presentations, which uh, very enjoyable to listen to, but I think also had a lot of merit, uh, each one in their own right. Um, I particularly liked uh, the last presentation, I'd say, because it's simple, uh, and it places a, a clear obligation on suppliers. I think some of the issues to do with switching, I think we need to look at in a bit more detail and how that affects there, but I, I liked that from a simplicity point of view, and I also liked the first presentation as well, uh, with the sort of, uh, with the, in terms of, you know, simply from a home ownership point of view, but how that works with lower value homes is something I think would need to be, uh, because we don't necessarily just want to have a policy that supports uh, people who are better off um, and are better off homeowners. Um, but I thought all presentations were good. I liked the uh, mortgages uh, uh, idea, but um, I think there are some complexities in the current mortgage models uh, and uh, the uh, issue that was raised as well about uh, putting uh, uh, about sort of uh, redu demands of reduction as well I thought was, was a good one but uh, particularly the first and last I, I, I liked uh, very much um, and uh, we'll uh, obviously I think in the context of Paris uh, and the comprehensive spending review um, I'm sure all of these and other options will be being looked at so thank you very much for taking the time to come uh, and present to us today I've enjoyed today uh, thank you for inviting thank me you. I'm going to have to disappear to go and look after some patients, but it's been a very enjoyable morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank Richard, would you like to continue? Sure. Well, I think the first uh, and the third, the um, stamp duty and the mortgage, is uh, are, are rather sort of similar in a, in a sense. So, uh, sorry, <clears throat> I can't really see a reason either. They both seem to be like eminent. Things. And what, what, one aspect that I think, Richard, you, you didn't really touch on with the green mortgages idea, but which I think is quite interesting, is actually what the public would like out of this. Is this an idea that they would welcome? Would there be public support? for You can envision that there, there actually might be. So, I mean, I, both of those seem to me like sort of no regrets things. I, I think there are questions about, you know, how quickly they would actually change uh, the uh, overall energy consumption and so on in the UK. But, you know, why, why not? I think the, the feed, uh, the, the, one, one just question, that, that there is an opportunity, there is an obvious sort of temptation for corruption around the sort of award, award of the EPC, if there's actually substantial sums of money involved, so that's something that might, one have, might have to look at with both of those um, things. With uh, the negawatts, I mean the idea is um, very intuitive, uh, I can see that there might be concerns over, over the bureaucracy of it, but I think the key would be get, seems to be get the balance right between the sort of top down, this is the re regime that we want to have, and the allowing the innovative suppliers to come into the market and find new business models that actually, that actually work. Um, and interesting to know what the tie in would be between that 
and the fourth uh, idea, if any, because you can see a situation in what in which some of those rewards for megawatts could actually be also potentially, you know, uh, take, taken by by power supply uh, companies. Um, the fourth idea, the um, obligation, I think, is probably just off the top of top of the head, seems to be the one that has the most. Um, potential for profound reductions uh, in energy waste uh, across the country. Um, one question I do have uh, is around the political um, feasibility of it, given that, in a sense, what you're asking uh, companies to do is to make less and less money over time. You know, and if I'm the boss of Sainsbury's and you come to me and say, I'd like you to sell less food over time, the first thing I'm going to do is push back against it. And we, we already see that the power that, you know, about six of the energy uh, companies have in this country. So I, I do wonder about right, that. But, but their demand is reducing over that's time sure. the time anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. So they need to find other ways to make money. Uh, absolutely. Like well, that, well, I mean, I, I, it would be an interesting one to, to put forward and see how it is. Because as I say, it does strike to me that the one that, you know, in the long run probably has the most potential for uh, improving energy efficiency. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you, you could probably do all four in tandem, couldn't you, as a, as a, as a policy... Uh, Yes. Uh, 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 as a policy Please. approach. Um, uh, I mean, if, if I had to choose, then I would, I would, um, I think I would instinctively go for those um, proposals which have more universal application. Uh, I mean, I, I, the, the, uh, the mortgage, the mortgage proposal, stamp duty proposal, yes, they, they could work well in the housing <coughs> sale and purchase market, but really the, uh, the, the the people we really want to get to, I think, in terms of uh, uh, this the whole task of uh, energy efficiency in in the in the housing stock are quite often situated outside the uh, the, the 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 rent the, the buy market, and they are in rented HMOs. Um, multiple uh, properties, etc. And unless you have policies that actually work across the board, then the danger is that you 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 leave certain people aside in terms of the policy uh, the, the policy trajectory. Um, I, I think, therefore, the uh, the energy uh, the, the energy company obligation I think is a very a, a, attractive uh, idea. Uh, in as much as the um, the target is absolute across the board, and um, the the energy companies, I would imagine, would actually have quite a lot of um, concentration on precisely that non-owned um, uh, sector in order to make the biggest gains, as far as uh, they were concerned, as far as their obligation uh, was concerned. So I think it would it could be very good in that respect. I just have a bit of a question mark against the um, uh, whether we would end up getting uh, you know, some of the sort of uh, I mean I recall say during cert uh, you know, getting free light bulbs mm -hmm. through the post uh, tick uh, that's done our that's done our bit there um, and uh, whether you would indeed get the, uh, uh, the, the, the the perverse outcome of, of um, energy companies trying to shed people who they didn't like, rather than try and capture people they did like. Uh, and there are, I'm, I'm sure energy companies are all uh, in this for extremely honorable um, <laughs> outcomes, but there, are, there, there is that, I think, that question mark. Um, the, the Negawatts uh, proposal, I think, I, I mean, that's long held very considerable attractions uh, to me. Uh, I mean, partly because it, it actively involves people in, the, in, in, the, in, in their own uh, energy uh, efficiency processes, and I think that could give a considerable additional uh, power handle uh, to that policy working. It does have uh, considerable problems of potential over bureaucratization, uh, but I don't necessarily think, particularly with the um, uh, the better uh, circumstances we've got in terms of information and um, uh, measurement uh, and so on, that those can't necessarily be overcome. So I think overall. I'd want to go uh, for that, but uh, all the schemes have uh, considerable merit, I think. Thank you. And, well, we're in, 
in danger of all being in violent agreement. But um, I like <laughs> all the ideas. That's why I invited you to pitch them. Um, I think the green mortgages and stamp duty go very well together, potentially. And I, I, I guess I share Richard's view. Why wouldn't you do those? I mean, the mortgage one in particular, it's, it staggers me that the setup is the way that it is. It's kind of, that is staggering in a way. So you, I kind of think, why wouldn't you do that? I, I almost feel like the feed-out tariff and the demand reduction obligation are mutually exclusive. You wouldn't do both of them. It's one or the other. Although you might, the, for some reason, the feed-out tariff feels to me like something you might do with business, whereas the DRO feels like something you might do with domestic. I don't know why. Maybe it's because you can think about the, um, power, the demand shifting of the large users uh, in, a, in a more intelligent way than maybe you can. It's easier to aggregate the big guys than the small guys. I don't know. Um, I think they're all great ideas, but um, some, I think the, the feed-out tariff and the demand reduction obligation are probably the ones I think that need more thought to actually, there's, a, there's more of a challenge to actually implement them, I think. Um, the DRA throws up some very interesting dynamics around customer acquisition or rejection. Like, would there be suddenly people who no one will supply? Um, I mean, you couldn't have that as the outcome, but there might be. Um, so, I don't think they knew that much about their customers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well, there is kind of an analogy, isn't there, in the sort of, you know, the health service, very reluctant to, to treat people, you know, that don't look after their own health in a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a bit, it might be a bit like life insurance. Like, if you go and get life insurance and you, you have a negative against virtually every question, your life insurance policy would cost an arm and a leg. And there's almost... You know, that, that's potentially there's this kind of social aspects to some of this that would need to be thought through. But I love the simplicity of it. It's just the kind of the practicality of it where you, it gets really difficult. Um, we are pretty much out of time, but what I want to do as one final thing is an audience vote. It's always great to have an audience vote. So you're allowed to put up your hand once only. It's not one. <laughs> I, I, we've all been quite simple. No, um, no. <laughs> Um, so you can put up your hand once only, um, so we can try and get some sort of winner. Um, but who goes for, let me get them in the correct order, who would like to go for the stamp duty idea? Hands. That's quite a few hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's about um, 18 or so. Okay, who will go for Dustin's energy efficiency feed-out tariff, feed-in tariff? One, two, three, four. Um, who goes for, um, who votes for Richard's um, green mortgage product? Six. And who goes for the demand reduction obligation? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Okay, so we do have a winner, which is the stamp duty proposal. Um, quite clear, actually. I think that that was quite a few, quite a few votes. So it was at least kind of 15 to 20 votes. So that's a clear winner. There we have it. Thank you.